Are You a Dark Dreamer? Author and screenwriter Richard Christian Matheson most genetically is. For whatever the literary format, he has done it all. Matheson has been a television series creator, story editor, and producer. His other credits include the TV movie Full Moon and the miniseries adapted from Dean Koontz's Soul Survivor. Among his credits as screenwriter, he co-wrote Loose Cannons with his father, legendary fantasist Richard Matheson. He has also published two acclaimed collections of short stories and one novel. He also wrote and directed the short film Arousal. A professional musician of 20 years, Matheson currently plays with a group Smash Cut with fellow screenwriters Craig Spector and Preston Sturgis Jr. Recently, Richard invited us to his home in Malibu where we discuss family, collaborators, and the dark side of the imagination, all without missing a beat. Richard, would you tell us about some of your current projects, please? I put short story writing aside for the moment, and uh, I'm working on three new novels, uh, one of which is sort of in the mystery suspense genre, um, two of which are a, a little bit more classically magic realism, <clears throat> horror, but, but of a more psychological kind. And then there's uh, six different movies. Two, one, of, one is an original suspense film for VH1. They're trying to really you know, crack that market and use rock and roll as a, sort of their, their backdrop, which is kind of interesting, and make it feel you know, integral, not just some sort of like, you know, jewel being chased by uh, you know, like, you know, hillbillies, although I think I may sell that one. And, um, and then uh, two other pictures that are you know, more sort of, uh, one's a comedy, and uh, the other one is, uh, what is, what the hell is the other one? The other one is uh, a pilot to become a series. How do you work with someone like Dean Koontz, who's kind of got his own strong personality? Well, he's, um, uh, he's very, um, uh, he's very low key, for one thing. You know, I think he, ha he must have an enormously strong uh, sense of himself, really, and, and does, but he in no way, there's nothing um, that imposes that on others. You know, he's very, uh, uh, he's very eager, I think, to, to listen to others. He's a good listener. He's a, he's a perceptive listener. Um, I think he's very, I think there's a kind of an, uh, a nurturing aspect to how he makes the conversation kind of come together, you know. And also, ultimately, it was his book. And so I didn't have any problem uh, really uh, understanding that that was the dynamic, and I wanted him to feel comfortable with the way it was going. But we abandoned a lot of stuff, and we made it very aerodynamic, and he was very quick to, you know, remove entire striations of it that just were not working for us. And, uh, and he's just a nice guy. He's, not, he's, a, he's a very easy guy to be around. But why would Dean choose you? In the professional sense, I was recommended to Dean by a guy I'd done another movie with, a guy named Tom Patricia. We had written, I had written a movie, and, and the, Tom and I had exec produced it for HBO um, about werewolves and police and hair. And, uh, and we'd had a really good experience together. And when Tom got his hands on Soul Survivor, he had optioned it. He thought, well, Richard would be great. And Dean knew who I was through you know, being in the field and everything. And we just had a couple preliminary chats because we never really spent any time together, you know, because he's living in Camelot down there, you know, and he's, you know, he's, he's kind of uh, a busy guy himself. And we just, um, I don't know, we just seemed to find a, com a, a, a pretty fast, compatible vibe together, you know. And I liked the book, and, um, and he liked what I had in mind for the book, and, and uh, it's, it fell together pretty nicely. It was interesting, though, because in working on the book, you know, my style tends to be very compressed and compact. Dean can be expansive and, and does it, you know, with great lyricism and does it with great, great uh, char character awareness and so forth. I mean, he's, it's not padding. I mean, he's really going in some interesting ways. And, you know, again and again, I'd come to a passage where I would think, well, I would have cut it right there. You know, and I would have, and in, in, the, in the sense that for me it would have worked that it was evocative and that there was something there where the reader would have to, in some Rorschachian way, fill it in, Dean would continue and he would go another page or two or three and it would end up in some beautiful way. And I thought, wow. So it was really interesting to watch the elaborative technique and the texture of what he was doing.
Richard, how do you choose your collaborators, or do, or do they choose you? Um, both. Uh, uh, it's people that I've gotten to know, like with Mick Garris. I think you interviewed Mick. We have you know, We Mick. just we had a uh, a very very fast and comfortable friendship together, and had a lot of the you know, a lot of the same references and stuff. And we wanted to do something, and we just started talking about um, uh, wanting to do a very exotic kind of high level jet set vampire movie. <clears throat> And then we began, and we just sat down, and we just started riffing on it. And it's you know, it's not unlike uh, playing with 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 uh, with Craig and Preston. And and Mick had been a musician and a rock singer, and really, it's very it's not unlike that. You just sit down and start jamming. And there are, and then there's other situations where I'm trying to think if there's anybody I actually actively pursued. I don't think so. I think they just it just kind of fell together. Same thing with my dad. I mean, we ended up writing uh, I don't know four or five movies together on spec, and and the, the and the the way it ended up with Mick and with my dad and with Michael was uh, that it was all done on spec to take advantage of that aspect of the marketplace, and uh, it worked great. It really worked great. But you need to feel, it's a little like dating, you know, you, you need to feel a comfort level. You need, you need to be interested in what they have to say, and you need to feel that they are interested in what you have to say. And, there has, and the third element is there has to be a kind of a moment of fusion that you both recognize. There's something that happens that is, trans, is transformative, so that, and, it's, and it has to happen quickly. It, there has to be a fluidity. I mean, this is, this is my feeling about, about collaboration, where I say something, you say something back, and we both see in it, we both see in it something that was not there, prior to each of us having added our particular side, and it, it's fusion. But the simple fact that your dad is Richard Matheson, there must have been an enormous influence for you to say, I've got the world's greatest teacher for writing right here every day in my house. It's my dad. Yeah, it, it, it dawned on me when I was, I was um, uh, about to head off on, a, on a, you know, a, a collegiate career of some sort, and I had written a short story that I ended up selling. Uh, and I was, I don't know, 17 or 18, I was pretty young. And uh, and I was writing a paper one night, and the story, and I had the letter of acceptance up on above my typewriter, you know, and um, uh, and I sat there and I thought, hmm, you know, this is really what I want to do. Do I really want to spend the next four or five years in pursuit of a degree? Just, and I called him and I said, you know, this is what I'm thinking about doing. And he did the coolest thing imaginable, uh, given who he is, given given the dynamic between a father and a son. He said, if you come home and you write, uh, but you have to do it every day, I will pay you. But you've got to do it every day, which I think saved him a few grand from the college expenses, actually. It may have just been an economic move. But I, I think it was, it was a very powerful, I'm kidding, kidding, Dad. But it was a, it was a powerful... Um, Incentive. Oh, God, yeah. And, and, and very, uh, it empowered a sense of my own destiny in a very big way. And... Uh, and always he took an interest. Always, always, always. Always was quick to read something, give me a candid but, but caring feedback. You know. In terms of your writing, what's the, what's the biggest jazz for you? Is it prose, scripts, what? Uh, prose is a lot harder. Prose is a lot harder. You, you, you know, you really, I mean, you're, you, you don't have the schemata of a script. You, you know full well that in its final execution, uh, the script, if it is made, will be fulfilled by so many different artists. Um, and with writing, it's it's really your it's up to you, and and you really have to calibrate in, in all the different ways. You have to calibrate in the description. You have to calibrate in how much of the story you tell. When I mean, it's it's a very complex undertaking. You know, I, I was working on uh, created by. And I had at one, and I just at one point I thought, Jesus, God, I'm getting so confused by this whole thing. And I had like 80 chapters or something, and I thought, well, no wonder you're confused. You know, it's I mean, there's just there was so much going on, and each, and I wanted something of pertinence and and a certain invisibility in each chapter, and um, you know, and you can pull it off, but it's it's a lot to supervise. And again, going back to what I said about scripts, you know, you only got 100 pages. With, if you wanted, you know, what is that infinite jest novel? I mean, you can write, you know, 1,100-page books if you want. And, uh, and it, it, can, it, it can be legitimate. It can be a legitimate statement. In a script, you're, you're stuck. Is there a master plan? <laughs> yes. 
Tell huge, it. Huge. Spill your guts. <laughs> no, there's no master plan at all. Uh, I just want to get, uh, you know, better and better and better at, at, at all the things that I love to do and, uh, and, uh, and connect with the people that I care about more and more deeply as I get further into my life. And, I, you know, that, that's plenty. If you can do that, then I think you've got, you've got a hell of a life, you know. And I certainly learned uh, after having my house burned down that it's not about material possessions. Uh, it's not about uh, any of that kind of stuff, you know. I, I mean, only to the extent that we all want to have a certain level of comfort and so forth. But, you know, that was a real, um, a genuine epiphany to just sort of look at the, the smoking carcass of what, you know, where you formerly lived and sort of go, you know, this isn't so bad. And it's not like getting a bad x-ray. You just sort of go, well, all right, I'll just kind of, and, and somehow I think we, uh, certainly as Americans, you know, we're, we're, we have this kind of almost, uh, we celebrate the, the endless expansion and consumption and so forth. And, and when it's all gone so quickly, you know, you, you can't help but see the folly of it all. Join me here again on the wild side of the imagination, where a sense of wonder and a feeling of terror can often intersect. You'll find us waiting here, the Dark Dreamers. <laughs>